the great lady, the first lady of Australian literature, Helen Garner. <laughs> Helen, you've seen me do that palaver many times now, hasn't it? I haven't seen you do the peace greeting. Haven't you? I think oh. we do that nearly every time. No, no, I haven't seen it. I think it's fantastic. You liked that, didn't you? Yeah, well, I, when I go to church, I, that's my favourite bit of the whole proceedings. And I, I remember going to, going to church once, I... A great friend of mine who was a rather introverted woman, and uh, you know, we had this sort of peace thing. And she said, uh, and we turned to each other at exactly the same moment. And I said, I love this bit, and she said, I hate this bit. <laughs> <laughs> she could hardly stand it. I, I grew up in Port Melbourne, was raised a Catholic, but it's the only part of the mass that I go back to now, and I actually look forward to it. And mm. I, I love that reaching yeah, out, yeah, it's too. really sweet. So, you're going back to church these days, what's that about? I've been going on and off for years. Yeah. Nothing new, yeah. Nothing new? No. None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought we were in a Catholic school. The principal over there would love this to go along a religious path. And you saying I've been to church lately, so I thought I might explore that a little bit. But you, oh, like, uh, the, you like the atmosphere and the, and well, the quietness. Well, it's, and... it's hard to say what I like about it, but I'll tell you what. Um, the, a friend of mine who lives in Sydney, I don't know her all that well, but I like to be friends with and I think we will be. She got in touch with me and she said, oh, look, I'm coming down um, next weekend and I just wonder if you want to go to church with me. And I thought, wow, that's, nobody's ever said that to me before. <laughs> and, uh, and it was like somebody said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I said, okay, I couldn't get there fast enough. And it was great. Yeah, I, lo I loved it. But, you know, I've been, I've been baptised, was baptised in 1962 as a grown-up. And I've... Um, I've um, come and gone, really, over the years, yeah. Is that got something to do with getting older and facing your mortality? <laughs> <laughs> um, God forbid. Is it? No, I, no, I just... Uh, I don't know why. Sometimes I just like to go. I like to hear those words read and, I, and spoken and uh, um, I like to get blessed. Uh, I, had a, I had an old born-again... Christian friend who used to say we were talking about taking communion and he said I'd crawl over broken glass to get that and there have been times in my life when I felt like that you know when I was um, in a mess yeah Father Bruno what time's confession <laughs> <laughs> straight after the last event <laughs> this is confession isn't it isn't this why I'm here <laughs> Helen Carter I, I meet you you come usually half an hour before these events and there's always a nervousness, and there'd be people going, but Helen, you do this all the time. You, you go to festivals, you're in high demand. One, I love seeing that nervousness, and I rang my son today and I told him how, how I have the butterflies and all of that. What, what's that about? Is that about saying, I'm not sure what it is that I can bring to this group of people here today, or what would they want to know about me that hasn't already been written about? Yeah, that, that's, that's particularly true. Yeah, yeah. that second one. <laughs> So why do it if you feel that that is the well, case? Well, I'm, I'm not tormented by nervousness, no. but I... Um, well, if you don't feel a bit nervous before you do something, it's sort of like you're a bit dead. I, there's something I read um, in a novel by Hilary Mantel once, and two characters are talking. One of them is wanting to do something important, and the, uh, and the other person says, uh, are you afraid? And the person says, yes. And the first person says, good, because nothing is worth doing without proper fear. I think that's... Uh, it doesn't have to be any incapacitating fear, but it, just 20 minutes before it starts, yeah. uh, you get that little adrenaline hit and you start Absolutely. feeling a bit shaky. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. And I go, what have I done here? And will I have the spirit that might lift that thing that we brought people to and, yeah. and what if we fall flat on our faces? Mm. Well, it's better to feel that than think, oh, God, I can yeah. shit this in. You know, I've done this a yeah, hundred times. Absolutely. And you can see sometimes at writers' festivals, you can see the people who feel like that yeah. and they're really boring and narcissistic. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've never felt that from you. Tell me... <laughs> Good. <laughs> this, this place, Sunbury, does it... I, I know you've been to many places, but you came up to the hill many years ago and, and we had students of oh, yours yeah, who were right. in that room. And that's I, right. You were really moved by that, weren't you? And you taught them when they were in year eight and yeah. hadn't seen them for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every now and then somebody comes up to me and, oh, I did, was doing a talk in Carlton a 
couple of months ago, and three, at the end, three jolly middle, middle-aged women came charging across the room to me, and, and with a younger one who's obviously a, a, a child, a teenager, and she was holding a copy of Monkey Grip. And they came up to me and said, do you remember us? And, and I, ha- of course I remembered them, you know, at Fitzroy High School. And, uh, yeah, I even remember their names. And we all fell on each other's necks and, and cried. But it was lovely. We were all laughing and crying. It was wonderful. And as a teacher, you have a very, um, you know, it's a very particular and precious relationship that you have with the kids you teach. Yeah. On Facebook, just out of the blue, this lady said, you taught me 40 years ago in Coringal. <laughs> I just want to tell you, you know, you yeah. made a mark. And yeah. It just made my day. Because you don't feel I that you're making a, a mark too. as a yeah, teacher. You, you feel, oh, God, they hate me and, yeah. and uh, you know, I'm and such I'm a And I'm raw bore. and I yeah. know nothing and, and I, what am yeah. I doing here yeah. and all of that. Yeah, all that. Do you feel that when you're being interviewed that people are trying to get from you, they want something, is, 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 is that a... Not in interviews. I feel like that sometimes when I... People come to me a lot and want me to read their manuscripts and I just can't, you know. I mean, yesterday, between breakfast and lunchtime, yesterday I had three requests for people from people who wanted me to read their manuscript for them and some of them I know and some of them I don't and I, I, I just realise I've got to say a sort of universal no really because yeah, otherwise... I understand why they would want to come to the Great Ride. Oh I mean it's flattering that people would do it but um, I can't, can't do any more. I haven't got time to do anything else. It's really kind of um, swells, swells and takes up all the space available. Yeah. yeah. I've known you about 18 years, I, I kind of figured, from the first time you At came least. up there. Mm. And I realised that our, converse, our friendship is really built around conversations that we have in front of other people. It's, yeah. it's a strange <laughs> paradox, isn't it? Because yeah. I reckon if you came to my house and said, and I sat you on my crumbling red couch, we probably would just do kind of small talk and that, but... Here I, get oh, to, I don't think so. Well, here I get to ask you about You're not everything. big on small talk, are you, so to speak? No, yeah. neither am I. But it is a privilege. The paradox of the publicness with the revelation, I, I kind of get it and it seems to work and people tell you amazing things and very intimate things. What, when you interview them? Yeah. yeah. And I'm going, I don't think that might have happened anywhere else. Do you, do you understand how yeah. that works? Yes, it's a, strange, um, it's a strange kind of triangular relationship as you, me and all of you. And... Uh, you, you, there's an off, you, you, well, I'd always rather be interviewed in a room where I can see people's faces. Yeah. At night time, you can't see anything. And, and in a theatre with lights blazing in your face, you think, well, is there anyone out there? I mean, you, really, you can't see anything. Yeah. So that's why people try to make an audience laugh, I think, yeah. because then, they, then we know they're there. <laughs> I've Thanks. <nearly> He's <laughs> <laughs> <Peace> there. <laughs> Ivan Illich said that you should only be in a room where you can actually reach everyone with your, with your kind of natural voice. Mm. I, li- I like the scale of that and I like this room because I feel yeah, without the mics and I can see everyone too. Yeah. Does, does that hearten you? Does that, does that lift you a bit that these people have kind of come into... Yeah, to I'm glad. Some... When I got here, there was no one here and I drove up and parked and I thought, uh-oh, this is, <laughs> hey, it's all over. <laughs> Wrong day. Yeah, I thought wrong day, Is wrong place. Wrong? Yeah. <laughs> are you getting better as a writer as you as you get into your seventies? Are you still as keen to do as well as you you were when you first started writing? Does it still matter to 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 give an account of yourself that that stands the kind of test of time? Yes. Uh, it's a whole different thing as you get older, though. I think. It took me a, a lot of years to figure out that it was okay to write in first person most of the time. I, uh, was that a big no-no? Oh yeah, when I started out it was yeah, you people... You use the I word. Well, that's what all, all the, the men said, that men back then, so I started writing in the late 70s and, and in Australia. There were, I mean, the, the explosion in, in publishing has it, been enormous over, over my, the years of my being a writer. But back then, not many books were published in Australia each year, and there was a very strong grip, I think, on, on the sort of so-called literary culture by a kind of male academic sort of feel. And 
I think when, when women came along and wanted to write about our own experiences in a very direct way, I think there was a lot of embarrassment that was felt and, and a sort of, there was something illegitimate about it and it was sort of gushy and too personal and, uh, and that, that sort of thing. But uh, over, over the years that I've been writing, which is quite a, you know, 40 plus years now, that seems to have um, you know, perhaps gone to another extreme. But the thing about it is to, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a skill in writing in first person where it doesn't have to be about yourself, but you can use yourself as a kind of, um, how can I put it? Observer? Well, yeah, as an observer, but as a, more as a sort of uh, like a little ball of energy that bounces around inside the story that you're trying to tell. And it, it's, it took me a long time to, and you see, I know how to do that now. Mostly, mostly I, I know this, this is a very common experience with not only writers, but artists of any kind. Every time you start something new, you think, I don't know how to do this. I thought I knew how to do it. I've already done it 14 times, but this time I don't know. And it's as if every time you confront a new uh, story or a new project, you've got no, you feel that you've got no accumulated competence. And, you, and in a sense, you haven't. I mean, well, deep down, of course, you have, because you know how to put sentences and paragraphs together. You know, in a technical way, you've got uh, a certain degree of competence. But, but when it comes to um, finding a place to stand in order to, oh, yeah, that reminds me of something. When I wrote that book called The First Stone, which was about Ormond College and all the bad things that happened there, uh, I, um, the very first public appearance I did about that book was in Sydney and it was at, the, uh, uh, at a big um, museum, art gallery, and I thought, oh, well, this will be just you know the same old little gig and I'll go along and talk. And I walked across around the quay and I came around the corner and there was a queue about a mile long of these furious-looking feminists. <laughs> and I, I looked at it and I, my heart sank, you know, I, I really, my heart went pitter-pat. And so I get up and uh, I gave my read a bit of the book and I, and I did my spiel and talked about how I'd come to write it and everything. And then, then it was open to questions and a, and a furious-looking young woman stood up and said, I'd like to know, what is your speaking position? And I didn't know what that term meant. I mean, it's a term that comes from literary theory, I think, which I knew nothing about. And so I said, um, I said quite sincerely, I said, what's a speaking position? And she went like this, <sighs> and, and rolled her eyes and let, let out this contemptuous blast of rage. But um, you know, so then I slogged on and, you know, the whole thing was a nightmare. But, 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 so, but, but as years went on, I, I've started to understand what the term means, speaking position, when it's not being used as a, a way to demolish another person for not having a speaking position. <laughs> and it's, it's, um, it is, I think actually that's what, when I approach a project, you know, I start, like just say, for example, I go to a murder trial and I've seen everything there is to see and I've got all my notes and I've got all the transcripts and then I go home and think, OK, how the hell am I going to write this? And that's when I have to find a speaking position. I've got to find a place to stand vis-a-vis -vis the story and the people in it, which is going to allow me to use everything I've got that I can bring to the telling of the story without being a narcissistic um, pain in the ass. So, and, 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 um, and that's what the struggle is, I think, every time. And finding that is torturous? Or yeah, it's or, torturous. It's hell on wheels. And it has a kind of world yeah. its own, kind of? That you have to wait for it to kind yes, of declare itself? Yes, all that. Yeah. And you can't rush it. That's another thing I've discovered. You know, if you start before you found, before that speaking position is kind of solidified in you, you start and you, you know that it's wrong because you're forcing it. Yeah. There's a sense of force and it won't flow. And you, if you keep on forcing yourself, which is the wrong thing to do, if you don't display humility before the complexity of the material, then you waste it. You waste it and you've got this crap on the page and no one will want to read it and it's boring and it's rigid and it's opinionated. So you have to sort of go through. And what do you do 
when you're waiting for it. I mean, I'm not being trite there. You, you go, well, I, I can't do much, so let me just go and walk I just walk around. I just walk around feeling, feeling terrible. No, and... I just feel bad. I mean, really? I, I feel like I'm having a nervous breakdown. So you can't even kind of get rid of it and no, just put it no, because to it's, the side? No, it's waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning yeah. material. Yeah, and it's just a nightmare. But but I've. And Is it's, it still like that? Yeah, really? and it's and it's like that for. See what happened was after I wrote that story about Robert Farquharson, the man who drove his kids into the dam. Uh, that, that was really uh, awfully painful. But so anyway, I, I got over it, and the book came out, and you know yeah, I sort yeah. of moved on. But but then then that poor lady at the. Uh, uh, out in Wyndham Vale, the um, Sudanese woman, woman uh, Congoida, who drove her kids into a lake. And um, somebody said, uh, the monthly said, oh, why don't you write us an article about that? Must have gone, I'm not going there. Well, no, for, uh, everybody I knew said, even before I'd thought of it, w my friends were ringing up and said, do not, under any circumstances, go to that trial. And I thought, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because it's just too agonising. But... Then I just happened, I was at a sort of a legal lunch and I happened to be sitting next to this judge that I know and I said, you know, just to be friendly, I said, oh, what do you got coming up? He said, oh, well, I've got to hear the case against the Sudanese woman. This was the same guy who heard the Farquharson case, oh, really? Lex Lesry. And uh, I said to him, how come they've given that to you? I mean, you've just dragged yourself through the Farquharson thing you know, and, and, and I know how traumatic it was. And he said, oh, no, I'm the person who, who decides who does which trial. Really? I go, why, why did you choose it? And he said, well, I just didn't feel I could give it to anyone else. It was so painful and awful. And I suppose he thought, well, he probably thought and knew that he did have some accumulated competence and he knew that somehow he could... He wasn't going to have a nervous breakdown. You know, he kind of... It was very painful for him, but he... he um... And you felt similarly for you then? In, in an well, no, the, I, well, well, the other thing he told me was that she was going to uh, plead guilty, which meant that there wouldn't be a jury, there wouldn't be um, a, a full-on trial, it would just be a, a plea hearing. So I thought, oh, this will be easy. I can do this, I vainly thought. So I rock up and... Uh, it was, the, it was like the Farquharson... See, as soon as I heard her past, her, the story of how she got out of the Sudan and, and, you know, she had to trudge across the desert with her kids in tow and they were being raped and, and tormented all the way. And then... It, oh, anyway, her story was just beyond dreadful. And... and um, I, I, but, one, you know, once again, once I'd started on it, I, you get to a point where you're so far in, the only way out is to keep going. You can't, right? you can't back out, you can't go sideways. You've just got to slog your way through to the end. And I, um, doing that it was just a couple of thousand words in, in, in a magazine, but it was like the Farquharson to the power of ten and compressed. So, and, but, you know, it, it seems kind of pathetic. I mean, I... I keep thinking, I'm such a wimp. I must be really middle class. That's what I always think. I think, because uh, I go to the courts and I see all these really tough journalists sitting there, girls half my age, you know, and they're doing a crossword under the thing. and They, they know how to deal with it. They don't allow themselves to be demolished by it. But if you're going to write a book about it, you have to let yourself be demolished and then put yourself together again. But I, I, I ran into... Um, but I sort of feel a bit ashamed. I think, I'm old. I've been around for so long. I should be able to do this without falling apart. But after the Farquharson one, I was sitting in, in the lobby of the ABC one day uh, waiting to be interviewed about some other matter. And the door opens and in walks this journo from, that I'd seen around the courts. He was, I think he was a radio journalist guy called Phil, and I knew we all sat together in the press seats at the, at the murder trial, and we say, you know, Phil, good day, Helen, you know, at the beginning of every day, and that's the only contact I'd ever had with him. So he comes in the door, and he sees me sitting there, and he rushes across the lobby. He said, Helen, Helen, how are you? I go, oh, OK, not too good, actually. He said, how are you after Farquharson? How'd you pull up after that? I said, oh, terrible. I practically had a nervous breakdown, and he said, so did I. I said, what, you? You tough... Juno, and he said, oh, he said, I, I left my job. He said, I, I could, felt like I couldn't go home from court, and the day I felt, felt that I'd contaminate my children. 
And those sorts of feelings that um, and, and judges and lawyers have the same problem. They always pretend they don't because they have to, you know, from, okay, there's the, the verdict, the person goes to jail, and the next day they're on to the next case. So they have to be able to pull themselves together quickly and keep going. So how did those people who reacted in that way react to your book and, and the fact that you didn't come out guns blazing and say, I, I know what's happened here, here is the final mm -hmm. kind of solution to mm -hmm. this, here is the final... Oh, well, well, you see, I think some people can only read crime if it's written like that, yep. uh, that, it, that they see it, like to see it as a... You've got to come out with that certitude. You've got to, you've got to come out with and you've got to say that the bloke's a monster who did the crime. And uh, I, know, I heard that people in bookshops, told, who work in bookshops, said to me, um, oh, there are some people who, won't, who don't want to read your book. You know, a lady came in yesterday and... She, and said, oh, I'm not going to read Helen Garner's book. Oh, I'm not going to read it. Uh, and the, the, the bookshop lady said, why aren't you going to read it? And she said, because nowhere in that book does she say that Robert yeah. Farquharson was a monster. Yeah. And I don't know how she knew that, seeing she hadn't read it. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but I, 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 that was very illuminating to me. And I, I thought, it's almost that people can't bear to contemplate somebody who would kill, kill his own children and, and... Do you feel you have courage that you have that ability to, to bear, to, to look closely at that? Oh, I don't know if it's courage. I'm, I'm just really, really interested. In fact, that's <laughs> one, of the, the, um, one of the homicide detectives I got quite friendly with in, in, in the Farquharson case. And uh, he was... Um, a really nice bloke, a very quiet bloke. And I noticed that when he sat in the court, so when I'm in court, I'm, you know, I'm moving in the seat and I'm twitching and scratching myself and trying to get a bit of chewy and, and because I'm nervy uh, when I'm in the court. But I noticed that he just sat absolutely still, completely uh, without movement or didn't blow his nose or you know, change his seat or anything. And one day I went up to him and I said, listen, um, tell me something. How come you can sit so still for so many hours through this thing? And he just looked at me and he said, I'm just really interested. And that was a very simple answer, but that's my answer to your question. It's the most interesting thing in the world to me to sit in a court. When you go back past Auburn College or you drive, do you, do you ever drive out to the dam with... Kids oh, I've been or... past it a few times. Yeah, well, the road's all been changed there. It just doesn't look the same. Do you go deliberately to, to, to kind of no. pay your respects in some way? or Well... Do you just happen to go... No, Had... my respects are in the book. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't... Mm. Is it holy ground? I don't feel that. Don't I don't know? feel it because I didn't know those children and I don't want to claim knowledge of them and I... I feel that you know anywhere where somebody died is holy ground, um, but I, I, I certainly I, I have driven down there and I did go to see their grave one time right at the beginning before I wrote the book. Funny thing was, I went to the cemetery, this is the Winchelsea Cemetery, and um, I, it took a long time for me. It's quite a small cemetery, country cemetery, and I it took ages for me to find the, the little boy's grave the first time I went there. And then finally I saw it, it was a big headstone and it had three um, headshot you know, photos of the dead children on the front, so I went to it and there it was. Years later after I'd finished the book, I went back and I could not find that grave. It didn't matter how much I went up and down the rows and I could not find it. I looked behind every clump of trees and it was, there's something in me that did not want me to see, that, see it again and, and I just could not find it and I've never been back since. You say about your writing, Helen, especially in relation to that book, you say, I long to mimic in my own work the brutal simplicity of the police photographs. Can you talk about that? What, that, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, well, back in the year 2000, I think it was, I was living in Sydney, and uh, I read that, I didn't know there was this place, but it's called the Justice and Police Museum. It's down near Circular Quay. It's a very old building. And I read somewhere that they had a, that some new curator had uh, gone into the storeroom there 
and found all these boxes and boxes of old negs of uh, photos that had been taken from as far back as the 20s and 30s. And he'd got out these boxes and had a look at them and they were the most fabulous photos. They were, they were t just, they were crime scene photos. They weren't trying to be artistic or beautiful. They were just the police photographers had gone out to scenes where terrible things had happened and taken photos. And they weren't always, often there were no bodies there. You know, they weren't like um, murder scenes. They were photos of places where someone had died. And there was something about them <clears throat> that I found terribly um, moving because they weren't, they weren't trying to be arty. They were just a simple approach to a place where someone had had died or been killed or, or had jumped to their death. And they were very, very um, quiet photos. They weren't specially framed or they were just matters of record. And they'd done it. So anyway, they'd done a beautiful show, that, an exhibition of these photos. And uh, they had a very deep effect on me. And I, I, um, I kept wanting people I knew to come with me so I could go again. <laughs> but no one had come. They all wimped out. They, they, they thought that there was something a little bit off about my interest in them, I think. And um, I don't think I ever got a single person to come there with me. But now there are whole books of them. You know, they've been beautifully reproduced and they're very, very fine um, historical documents. Uh, and a lot of them, you, you, you see them, I think they're on sale at various um, uh, museums and art galleries throughout the country, just big beautiful black and white shots, but sometimes it's just a shot of, of four detectives in hats and suits standing night by a creek looking at the ground and you can't see what they're looking at. Or um, an empty room, the window's open and there's a little cheap lace curtain just lifting on a breeze and you don't know what's happened there, but something really important and painful has happened there. And often, some of the photos didn't have any um, identifying material with them and you, you didn't know what had happened in that room. But I, they affected me deeply because there was something humble about them. They weren't going, let's say, let's look at this bastard who did this crime. What sort of a bastard is he? He must be a monster. You know, that, all that sort of rhetoric was completely missing. It was just someone quietly coming in and recording a place where uh, some enormous... Thing had happened. So when you look back at your writing, do you say, I've achieved that thing that I was longing to achieve? Or well, the only way I can tell if I have or not is whether people can bear to read the book, really. And, and I, I'm surprised, a lot of people write to me and say, I didn't think I was going to be able to read that book. But I actually, um, strangely, I felt, found that I even enjoyed it. And I remember when <laughs> there was, I, I took a young girl with me to the trial Yes. And she was a very, very clever, actually a very brilliant 16-year-old who yes. just who just roared through high school. And there was... are laws against taking people out of school. <laughs> no, she'd finished. <laughs> but um, but she um, yes, and she was a, a terribly clever. I mean, like four times as clever as me. A really brilliant girl without anything to get a grip on yet. She just had this brain, and I see she was sitting around at home watching daytime TV. And I said, "Listen, you better come to this trial with me." I asked her mum first, who was a friend of mine. And uh, anyway, so she was rather um, unemotional about it. You know, she's just a teenager with that look on her face. You know, they think, "Hey, yeah, impress me, try to impress me." That sort of look. Anyway, she she used to wear this little hoodie, and um, and it was a sky blue hoodie. And on the day that Cindy Gambino, the mother of the dead boys, gave evidence, I mean, everybody, everybody in the room was completely spellbound. And I looked around and I could see, in the corner of my eye, I saw her make a movement with her arm. And I glanced around and the whole sleeve of her hoodie was black with tears. Uh, I don't mean black like mascara. It was just that she, tears had poured out onto this. And I, and I put that in the book. And a friend of mine who knows her and knows how hard she is to, um, yes, to move, uh, said when I, she said, I didn't think I could read this book, said my friend, but when I got to the bit about Louise, Louise's uh, hoodie sleeve being black with tears, she said, I burst out laughing. And I thought, wow, that's great. 
because, I mean, there are, you, you can't be sort of holy around these things all the time and, and solemn. In, in the court, people laugh sometimes. Even, even the accused person can burst out laughing and in, a, in a trial where you'd think everyone would be just so traumatised that laughter would be beyond them, but it's not so. One of the um, essays in your book, Everywhere I Look, which I think is the most perfect title, and I think... If you're going to teach a writing class, you'd be going, OK, we're going to write a book everywhere I look, and that, that would be the title for every person's book. You say there was an, a, a, a piece called The Insults of Age. I'd known for years, of course, that beyond a certain age, women become invisible in public places. The famous erotic gaze is withdrawn. Why is that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do you need me to spell it out? No, I do. <laughs> I, I, one, I think that's a sad thing that, that does happen, if that, can, if that does really happen. I believe it, it does, but I'm not, I'm not doubting mm. you. Uh, why is it sad, though? It's, it's, I mean, some people find it sad, but it's really extremely sort of liberating to, to some extent, isn't it? I mean, do you, sometimes you feel a bit down in the dumps about it, especially when you're walking along with your glamorous um, granddaughter and she's about a foot taller than you and striding glamorously and you're sort of like the little town mouse scurrying along beside. You think, well, guys used to look at me once. <laughs> but it's pretty, uh, pretty liberating thing. You know, you, can, you don't have to dress up and you can wear flat shoes all the time if you, if you want to. You know, you're free, ladies, to wear heels. But um, yeah, and, but but it is true that I think as an older woman, you do enormous advantages accrue, and one of them is I think that you're no longer threatening to people. Um, you know, if you've got that sort of nana look, you you get the privileges of a nana on public transport, and I don't mean people standing up for you because hey, good luck with that. <laughs> but I get stood up for occasion. But but, uh, but I mean. The fact that I can strike up a conversation with anybody now and nobody's scared of me, nobody thinks I'm trying to race them off or, or you know, kind of rob them or anything. So I, it's just astonishing what people say to you and what stories they'll tell. It's fabulous. You had that wonderful story of that bloke um, just after the Jill Ma murder on the station, didn't you? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and he just kind of sidles up to you and he, yeah. he wants to show you something in his phone, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I'm sitting in the, in the, on, on the platform at Parliament Station, underground um, station. It's about 9.30 at night and I'm on my way home. And there's a few people there. And there's this guy sitting along the seat from me, a youngish bloke, you know, in his 30s. And... Um, he suddenly starts to kind of edge towards me like this, and I thought, oh, God, what's this? And, and then he, he sort of held his hands out to me, and he said, um, excuse me, he said, um, my wife's just given birth to our first child. Could I share the photos with you? Oh. I'm going, oh, yes, yeah, yes, please. And so we shared the photos, and, and they were... And he told me the story of how she'd given birth in the ambulance, and he'd been screeching out in his car from Glenroy to try and get there, and... And, uh, and you become friends, don't you? Well, you get yeah. on the train. Yeah, we got on the train together and, you know, he was going to Broadie and I was going to Newmarket, so we were on the same <laughs> You're right, on the line. Craigieburn the line. Craigieburn line, yeah. But um, we had this very strangely intimate conversation. I mean, you know, we were both crying a bit looking at the photos because it was so... And I just thought, God, it's like someone came up to him and put a crown on my head and said, I can, t you know, you're the person anybody can tell anything to. And I, I was just so honoured that he showed me the pictures, and yeah, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah. But there must be something about you that allows that man to yeah, do that, I'm doesn't a nana. It, In that non-threatening <laughs> way. I'm a nana. He didn't, wouldn't know me from a bar of soap. He didn't know that I was a writer. Yeah. He didn't know my name or anything. No, no. no he was just this Turkish guy from, uh, from Broadie. And uh, yeah, he was great. And we, we just had this lovely um, moment. Hmm. And that's the privilege of well, that makes up for a hell of a lot of not getting looked at in this, admiringly in the street. But, yeah, it's more interesting to be shown somebody's birth photos than to have someone say, hey, you look sexy. You know, that's it. But you seem I'd to get yourself into readily. those predicaments a bit, aren't you? In, in your diaries, you know, you're on trains and you're moving around. Do, do you think there's an approachability about you that... that 
that well, has not uh, got to do with your age, but it's got to do with something that says, I can tell her. Well, I, what I notice is in modern life, there's not that much eye contact that's given, especially by young people. People seem much more defended against um, the, each other than they used to. I, I'm sometimes quite shocked by the absence of people saying good morning to strangers or giving eye contact to strangers. I, I, so I feel quite wounded when people walk straight past me and because I'm ready to say hello to anyone in the street. And most, most people, older people, will nod or smile. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for their life story, although if they want to give it, I'll listen. But... <laughs> but um, it, it is, maybe it's a modern thing, a change in, in the way people sort of behave. I don't know if it's the same in the country as in cities, but I, um, I think um, if you're the sort of person who immediately gives eye contact to a stranger, that's already a few steps towards some sort of encounter. With that moment, with that bloke, the broady bloke, hmm. is there a moment in that that you go and this is so wonderful and there's a beauty in this and there's an intimacy in this, that this is worthy of being written about or, or is that something that, that comes totally later? And is that a way of kind of savouring the thing a second time and going, mm. by writing it, I can capture it and relive it and retaste it? Yeah, I, I, while it's happening, I'm not thinking, ooh, I'm going to write about this, because I'm right there in the moment. It's only afterwards. Or See, I keep a diary. That's another thing. You know, if that was, that'd be the sort of encounter that I would describe in a diary. And so then maybe a week later, I'm trying to write an article, and I think, oh, I could tell about the guy on the train. Yeah. You know, the world's full of little tiny incidents that, when you pick them up and look at them, have quite a lot of value and meaning and sometimes sometimes at, at the moment they're happening you just think oh oh this is lovely he's showing me his photos but then you know you think of all the other things that come yeah. to your mind later isn't there a isn't there also a sense in if I pull that out and and do that I, I could desecrate the moment or or change the moment too I don't think I I'm not afraid of desecrating things I'm actually in favour of desecrating some things. What sort of things are worthy of being desecrated then? Oh, um, uptight, uh, uptightness, pomposity, meanness, um, the kind of little um, castles that some people build to their own importance, that's worth desecrating. But you don't have to do it like meanly. You can do it um, in a subtle way sometimes. Um, Michael Lunig's in the audience and he's a great fan of the psychiatrist Donald Winnicott. And oh, yeah. Donald Winnicott said the dilemma for most artists is the, the kind of w wanting to communicate but, but also not wanting to be found. I, I've paraphrased it very badly. Is that true for you, Helen, that, that here I've got 120 people and the, the need to want to reach out and, and give them something and communicate really profoundly is strong, but at some moment I also want to drift off and never have to talk about myself again, perhaps. Yeah, that would be nice, but I, I think I'm probably stuck with it now. Um, see, I mean, I don't think of myself as, a, as an extrovert. I think that I, you know, I like people and I'm, and I'm interested in them and I, I like to sort of be with other people. But uh, I have got a very deep need to be on my own a lot. And you can't be a writer unless you can tolerate huge amounts of solitude. Sure. And uh, that, that, but that sometimes makes you a bit crazy. Yeah. You, you can, you know, you can go up a gum tree with that. Uh, but, but there's every chance that these people have all read your books and that, and you're going, this is my readership. This is not just the reader out there in some, you mm. know, kind of floaty, airy kind of way. These are the punters who, mm. who actually buy my book. Yeah. And these are their beautiful faces. That, yeah. that must be profoundly moving it too. Is. No I love ever. it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming. I really am glad. <laughs> I saw you at the Willie Lit Fest a few years ago and at the end it was a sizable crowd and, and, and the applause was sustained and you stood there and I'm thinking, Helen Garner is really enjoying this moment. I don't mean that in a, any cruel kind of way, but I just thought... <laughs> you mean I should have hated it? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it just speaks to that, I, I have communicated, here is my constituency, mm. 
and they, they've honoured me yeah. and, and you yeah, stood well, in that lovely. moment very it gracefully. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, pro I was probably mortified with embarrassment. Yeah, I was watching the footy last night and... Um, watching the footy. Well, well, I followed the Western Bulldogs and um, so last night was... Actually, I, I didn't see it last night. I saw it this morning because uh, I was doing something else and I had even forgotten it was on. But you know that boy, um, the one who's the great nephew of Lou Richards? Yes. He's got red hair. He's got yes. red curly hair. Yes. And he's really very... Uh, he's a very good player and he's going to be a great player, I think. But he kicked a couple of goals and... And uh, when he turned around after the first goal he kicked, he had this look on his face that made me burst out laughing. He sort of stuck out his tongue like a kid. He sort of went like this. And he, had, he had this hilarious expression on his face. And he was so excited and thrilled. And all the, you know, how all their teammates rush up and, you know, touch yeah. their hair for good luck or whatever the hell they're doing. Yeah. But um, he had this look on his face. And, and it is, I, I do still feel that that look expresses some of the things I feel when I... You know, when I got here today, there was nobody here, and I thought, oh, you know, as I said before, I thought, oh, no, that's it, it's really over. And then when I come through the door and I see all these people, I feel like that red-headed boy. I feel really excited and pleased <laughs> <laughs> and slightly surprised. <laughs> Helen, when I invited you to come here, I wrote you one line. I said, oh, dear Helen, would you like to come and have one more twirl on the dance floor? And... <laughs> Well, how could I say no to that? No. Yeah. I, I know, Just but, one more? But I suppose what I'm saying is you didn't go, and what are we going to talk about, and we can't go there, and don't ask me that. It was just kind of going, I'm up for the dance. That was lovely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I can't imagine. I mean, if anybody asked me a horrible question I didn't want to answer, I just wouldn't answer it. Sure. Yeah, but sure. um, you, haven't, you haven't asked me one of those yet. It leads me to that more recent interview you did in the monthly, of course, and... The, oh, yeah. the interviewing meets you every week and all of that. I reckon we should meet... He does not every, meet me every week. Did he every say that? Every second week or something. Doesn't he meet you regularly or something? No, I have a drink with him occasionally. He's okay. a nice guy. I like him. So. Yeah. But do you, uh, yeah. he's okay. overstating it, if that's Am what I? he said. Well, maybe I... I maybe, no, no, don't, don't clobber him. No, I, no, I, I won't. I wouldn't I'm, dream of it. Yeah. No. I think somewhere in that piece you said... You're going to hate me going here, but I have to go here. If I end up with a man again, oh, and I God. don't think I will... He would have to be a dancer. He couldn't be embarrassed about dancing. Mm. Well, yeah. I say to my boys, I have three of them, mm. whatever you do, dance. Oh, I think that's wonderful advice. Because that is terrific advice to a boy. Isn't it? Yeah. I'm yeah. often on dance, and I don't mean to sound um, egocentric, but I'm often on dance floors with eight women because they're mm. all going, my husband is over there, oh, yeah. and he used to dance with me. And he doesn't anymore. Yeah. And they're going, you, you'll have a go. And they seem to... Mm. Am I right about that? Is it important still? Well, I just... Uh, I remember back in the 70s, you know, we used to... I, I, we used to go out dancing a couple of times a week just to hear a band in a pub. And, and all the guys used to dance too. And, and, uh, and well, yeah, it was great. It was like a sort of a mass dancing, you know. Nobody was dancing in, as, you know, in pairs, which I now look back on rather sadly because... When I was a teenager, we had dancing lessons in Geelong and we learnt to do, you know, this the proper uh, ballroom style, the which I actually hair, loved. I loved that. But then everything got all tribal in the 70s. And, um, but, yeah, I... Um, why, why should that person be a dancer? What, what is it? Is there... Well, it's it just there something in... about moving to music. I mean, the idea that music can't move your body... It's sort of a bit sad, sad to think about to me. Well, I I have um, no. I, I could was about to say something nasty about one of my husbands, and I won't do that. <laughs> I, I won't do that. Yeah. That was a great disappointment to me, Mister. Mm. I'm not saying his name. No. So you it? hold that hope of meeting this dancing man? No, nah. no, I'm not looking for another guy. I interviewed you about seven years ago at the um, the rotunda there and. Mm. And um, there was this metaphor of you being on the embankment and watching people as they were swimming and the river the water was kind of glistening oh, well, their yeah. beautiful okay. bodies. And you yeah. said, I'm happy to kind of watch them glistening. And I said... <laughs> glistening, that's yeah. your word. Yeah. I thought... No, what I, I, thought I, I remember going, what I said. I'd no, I remember like what I be, said. Yeah. I, no, I remember what I said. I said... Now that I'm on the, uh, on the other bank, you know, now that I've, I've realised that I'm no good at being married, I'm just no good at it. I've tried it three times and it was a stuff up every time. 
and it ended up badly every time it started well. But then I thought, well, you know, I've just come to the point where I couldn't go there anymore because it's too painful. And, and when I realised that, I felt I had a wonderful sense of freedom. And, and I, I think I probably said to you something like this, that I'm standing on the other bank and I can see people still thrashing their way towards that bank. And I want to call out to them, keep swimming. It's great when you get over here. <laughs> That's keep, what I probably... They keep dancing too. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Do we show a vulnerable side of ourselves if we dance? Do we show a... Yeah, you a can make soft... a fool of yourself if you dance. And um, people are afraid of that, that they'll look silly when they dance. I think well, some people do look silly, but who cares? Are we more concerned about the way we look than we than we were when you were younger, do you think? Are we more bound by a lot of these cultural things that stop us from dancing? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why people don't dance. Yeah. I don't know the answer to those questions. So if you stay for Sarah Carroll at the end of tonight, we'll move the chairs and we'll have a twirl, OK? Mm. Oh, let's see the music first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Oliver, the, the American poet, is in her 70s and she still goes, I want to be frolicsome, I want to, I want to be naughty, I want to do things, I want to be a risk taker. Mm. Is there a bit of that in you still, Helen Garner? Mm. I want to, what sort of risks does she mean? She sometimes jumps out of trees. Oh, you know, well, no way. No, I've got osteoporosis. She lies down in the fields. <laughs> I think she would dance with a random stranger. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, yeah that's a nice yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. You play the ukulele too, don't you? Oh, I haven't picked it up for years, actually, maybe two years. I, I, I actually looked at it. I've got a friend who came to stay this weekend, and, um, and he's quite a good uke player. I mean, he was good enough so that when he was completely broke in some other city, he uh, took his uke and went down to the street and played and got himself enough to, for a hotel for the night. But I'd be still sleeping on the pavement if I tried to do that. <laughs> no, I, I So if I had okay. said, bring you bring your ukulele, Helen, and play for the hundred people in the room, would you have done no, that? No, I wouldn't have, Bruno. <laughs> Does it take a certain madness to kind of do that? No, it just, a... it would be ridiculous. It would yeah. Be, <laughs> yeah, that's not a thing that's ever going to happen. So if I write to you in a year's time and go, Helen, mm -mm. another twirl, will you be up for it too? Yeah, wait and see. Yeah? Yeah. Do we, do we get to know you by hearing these... Is there some sense in which people go, I, I, there's some insight, there's some kind of way of understanding another human being that has been gained by this business of conversing and revealing? Is, is that an important thing still to do? In general? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, I like to hear people being interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's an important thing to do. What would you like these people to walk out of? What feeling after what having... What are you doing to me? I'm not enjoying this part. Go on. What would you like... I, I, there's nothing... The I've, I have no answer to that question, Bruno. You'll come up against the brick wall, man. you would have watched them as they go down the gravel no, car park... No, it's their business. Is that? Yeah. I have the deepest goodwill to everybody in this room, but I wouldn't dream of saying, I want you to feel X, Y and Z, and if you don't, I'm never coming back for another twirl. <laughs> No, no, I wasn't assuming that you were going to say that about them. But I, I just thought you might be hopeful that there, is, there would be some no way. spring in this I just next simply step. Would going, not I've just be, heard no, Helen. No, no, no. I wouldn't. I'm, I no, don't think like that. No, I'm not. I don't think like that. You don't think like no. that at all? No, absolutely not. No, because no. I'll be watching as they go. And I'll yeah, well, yeah, but, that, but that's your gig. Yes. That's why you're worried about it. I'm not. I, 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 I just, I just, I kind of enjoy doing it, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's good. No, and you're good at it. Yeah. But you're up against the brick wall now, so don't yeah. push. Helen, yeah. Helen, what, what, what's, what's your next book? Is there a book? Is there an article? Uh, well, I haven't got a book, but um, I've got this gig at the monthly. I, every other month, I go down to the court, and they, they got in touch with me and said, "Do you want a court column?" And uh, I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you, you obviously like going to courts. Do you want to write for us about, about that? And so I thought, oh, yeah, that would be nice because, you know, I'll take any excuse to get into a court, basically. <laughs> and so I've done... T I've already handed in two and only one of them's been published so far, but um, that's what I'm doing at the moment, yeah. Beautiful. So how is yours different from another journalist? 
Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, there's um, the guy that uh, appeared for this is what springs to mind. The the guy that appeared for uh, the Sudanese woman, uh, Akon Gwode, her her barrister. I mean, um, he uh, he was a bit thrilled that I wrote about him in the article because they all want to get written about. And uh, but but another woman has written a book in which she talks about his his um, work on that trial. And just before I came out today. I got a text from him, and it was a photo that he'd taken of the of the big paragraph in the book where this other writer, whose name is Robin Bowles, uh, had described him and his work. And uh, he was really thrilled with it because when I when I wrote about him, I said that he had a face as pale as a teacup, and he was not pleased <laughs> about that because he had smooth smooth white cheeks. And I was trying to show, I was trying to say that he. Um, looked r rather sensitive and, and pale. And I didn't want to say he was pale with fear, but I think he was. But uh, anyway, so he sends me this, this other writer's version of him. And, uh, and he was um, quite thrilled with it. And, and I looked at it and I thought, that is a piece of shit <laughs> as writing. I thought, mine's much better than that, I thought. But then I think probably if I look at it later, I'll see that, it, that, that mine isn't that much better. But it's just, uh, she had a different way she described, I, I thought I could just do it in one blow by saying he had pale teacup cheeks. But she's gone on for like a paragraph saying he was very polite to the judge and um, I think he was uh, rather old fashioned in his blah, blah, blah. You know, it was kind of like a detailed description of his style. And I probably wouldn't do that because, you know, I'm, I, I like to think I could do things faster and move fast. But, but I... Um, but I also like to read John Sylvester in the, the Age. I think he's terrific. I think he's hilarious, and and he, and of course, he's um, uh, often writes about police. Uh, but he's recently he's done a few pieces about um, sitting in courts and describing courts. And uh, well, he's much more hard boiled than I am. I mean, he's really been around the traps, and I haven't. Uh, so he is more. I don't, I was going to say cynical, but I, I don't mean that. I mean, he's, he's got a harder surface on what he writes. And I, I'm always trying to get to the, um, the, yeah, or to the sore bits of people. You know, I, I, um, I, I've been in magistrate's court a lot lately, and, and magistrate's court is, as everybody knows, it's where all the really the painful, sore, minor sort of things come rolling through there and, and they're dealt with extremely fast. And I, I went to the Jong Magistrates Court and just sat there for a day and I reckon I could have got like five books out of those stories that were there because they fast like that, 20, 30 cases go flying through. And I, I'm used to being in the Supreme Court where one case goes on for seven years or three months or something. It's a completely different approach. But... Um, I'm just interested in looking at people who are in extremis, I suppose, to see what people are in deep trouble and, and to figure out how they got there and what sort of people they are. And I'm more interested in that than the sort of detective, um, you know, finding out who did what, when. And, you know, I, I'm, so, I'm always trying to find out in what way those people, as it were, resemble me or the sort of people I know. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Any other questions before we'll have to wind up in a few minutes? Any other questions? Just, yeah, bellow it out. I can bellow. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, do you have a favourite book of yours? And why is it there? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and uh, and I yeah I, I like it that one. One last question, yeah. He bit me. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> yeah, that was awful. But and at the end of that, um, at the end of that, I, I really thought that the, the sort of bond between us had, had been broken. <laughs> uh, and I thought, and actually, I think I ended the story by saying, in, in his wild dog heart, I think he despises me. <laughs> but, but it turns out he doesn't. He's quite fond of me, really. So <laughs> that all worked out OK. But thank you. I really enjoyed writing that. Because you Yeah, totally. <laughs> One yeah. last question from this side. Anyone going once? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks very much. I wanted to, yeah, thank you. It's important to me that I stayed in Melbourne, actually. Yeah. I think yeah. Some, was there a hand? There is a hand, yeah. A question? Oh, okay. oh thanks. Oh, thanks <laughs> wow. to Bruno, yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> thank you, thanks very much. Could you please thank the indomitable, the irrepressible <laughs> Helen Garner? And why am I shouting?